You know, the holiday spirit remains with us for only moments, it seems. The gifts have been opened. The holiday guests, once sweetly anticipated, have now been dispatched away to their own homes. (laughs) And we finally have a quiet moment to reflect. But in an instant, if your house is like mine, in an instant we uh, are awakened to the hard edges of the world. We remember so well in the Christmas story, the wise men had departed for only a brief interlude before the reality of the outside world came crashing in on Joseph and Mary. And we know that the scenes of Bethlehem would pass quickly into an escape in the evening to Egypt. Mary, as the story goes, had treasured the moments of the birth of Christ pondering them in her heart. As the music that we just uh, celebrated said, well, perhaps she did know. Mary, did you know? That the baby that she held would one day walk on water. That the child that she delivered would someday be the deliverer of the entire world. And that the one that she held in her arms was indeed the great I Am. It was Joseph who revealed his latest dream that he had received from an angel, a vision from heaven, and he shared that with Mary, and surely she knew in her heart everything was about to change. Who could blame her for asking, so what now? Let us pray. Gracious God, open our hearts that we might hear your word clearly. Help us to see past the tinsel and the decorations of the season to rediscover your grace offered without preconditions and with infinite love. We pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. Well, have you ever found yourself caught between a rock and a hard place? Most of us have. Uh, That may be a little harsh for a day like today. Perhaps maybe I can ask, have you ever found yourself caught between something really good and something potentially even better that may be easier for some of us to identify with. At times we find ourselves in a moment of transition. Things are going reasonably well, perhaps exceedingly well, and we pause and we take a breath only to anticipate what might happen next. In that moment, we might find ourselves like Mary, asking, so what now? It is a a momentary interlude. It's an intermission between a two-act play in a theater, if you'll imagine, that one that can invigorate us or one that can cause us to fall to our knees in prayer. The interlude, the intermission, The pause in the action can be the most powerful moment in the telling of a great, great story. It sets the stage for what the storyteller hopes to shape in our imagination, the interlude, the pause. Today I want to reflect on just such a moment, a brief interlude in the Christmas story toward the end, if you will. It's a pause after all of the mind-bending events of the birth of Jesus, but it's far from random, far from coincidental, as we'll see. It reveals the art of storytelling as used by the writers of the Gospel of Luke. We're so familiar with the story there, and also the writer of Matthew, Matthew. The interlude a pregnant pause, a moment of silence, a moment that fills the concert hall with anticipation, one that offsets the ultimate crescendo of the orchestra. It is the storyteller's greatest creative tool. It's a moment that we realize without exception that we may be caught between a rock and a hard place. You know, preaching on Sunday after Christmas can feel something like that. (laughs) 
It's not exactly like we're stuck here between a rock and a hard place. We're not suffering for Jesus up here, but it is something like being caught in between, between something really, really good and something that has all of the potential to be really, really great. Think about it. We're all here today, and if you're like me, we are suffering from our Christmas hangover, for lack of a better description. Not in the real sense of the word hangover, but in the 12 days of Christmas sense of the word. You know what I mean. We've just experienced the very best of the best that Christmas has to offer. The best moments in the Christian calendar are lingering in our spiritual memories. The celebration of Advent, the Christmas Eve services, Christmas Day and all of that wonder the very best experiences the church has to offer in worship and praise and sharing the good news of Jesus with great joy and the prayers and the music, oh, the beautiful music that we experience here in this church. The best of family and friends and community all wrapped up in a beautiful red bow. Well, all of that's behind us now. If you're like me, you're in the midst of a Christmas hangover. We're in the midst of a sugar plum fairy, uh, elf on the shelf crisis that echoes the sounds of the Nutcracker Ballet over and over in our head. (laughs) But now we're in a Christmas recovery moment of sorts. There's scotch tape stuck to the edge of our shoes. Why, some of you are still wearing your house slippers, I see. (laughs) There's wrapping paper still stuffed in our pockets, torn to shreds by giddy, sugar-crazed grandchildren, or maybe our own grandchildren or our own children who we could barely recognize through the haze of uh, Santa standing behind the mistletoe. (laughs) There's ribbons and bows everywhere found in the most unexpected places of all. Why, some of us even have the faint whiff of hot chocolate on our lips this very morning. (laughs) We gather here today, and we're in the midst of our Christmas hangover, and we're on the rebound. We're in recovery today. Welcome to Christmas and New Year's. (laughs) My daughter, Michelle, she worked in local theater for several years after college, and she would describe this moment as our Christmas Day slash New Year's Eve interlude, the intermission in the play, so to speak, before things get really, really interesting on New Year's Eve. She would say the curtain has been drawn on the first act, but the orchestra is already warming up for the call of places by the underpaid stage manager. She assures me that all stage managers are vastly underpaid. (laughs) It's the calm before the storm, before the excitement of New Year's Eve. We can taste the new year to come. It's so close. As Bishop said earlier, the good news is that the new year ahead is actually the year of our Lord 2020. (laughs) At a a recent uh, Christmas party, my favorite father-in-law said to me, can you believe we get to experience a rerun of the Roaring (laughs) Twenties? How great. With all, with all the good stuff, you know, only. His wife, Lori's mom, said with an uncharacteristic retort of sarcasm, he's only 83, so he must have seen it on reruns. <laughs> Touche. Good job. <laughs> By virtue of that numerology alone, oh my gosh, we, you know, the world and our culture, we're getting ready for something super powerfully extraordinary All our hopes and dreams are coalescing around the ideal of a better tomorrow, a better hope, a better future to come. And all our plans for the new year are bigger, better, deeper, richer, and more profound for the moments ahead. All our fears are vanquished. Nothing can hold us back. Takes our breath away. But here we are together figuratively between the past, yesterday, Christmas, and the anticipation of an even better tomorrow, the new year to come. If a rock and a hard place could be redefined to be better and best, then we would definitely become, uh, be caught between a rock and a hard place, between our best and what is even better yet to come, we hope. 
That's the trouble with interludes, with intermissions. The first act of the play has a way of ending on the edge of a plot twist that is curious at best, mysterious, almost without explanation, and sinister at its worst. Cue the foreboding, ominous music. Bum, bum, bum. Interludes can be like those little tiny moments we find in Hebrew poetry. It tells us to take a breath, to pause, to reflect, to contemplate on the deeper meaning of the text that we have just read. You've probably come across it in the Psalms. It's the little word, selah. Its original meaning has been lost to us, but scholars think it was a musical annotation. It means to pause momentarily for consideration, a full stop, a musical rest, an interlude. One author defines an interlude like this, a quote, an interlude is a literary device used by authors, dramatists, to provide comic relief to the audience from an overpowering tragic or gloomy mood created in highly tragic scenes. The same can be true for comedy. If we didn't have an interlude once in a while, why, we'd just laugh ourselves silly. We love interludes. We love intermissions. We love those pauses. We love those times of silent reflection. They offer us the emotional space to spread our wings, to recover from the physical tensions of the moment, to to find emotional and spiritual rest and recovery, those moments. And that's why many of us are here today. We offer this place as a sacred space where we can all catch our breath from the Christmas chaos and get ready for what is to come. Something very good and very exciting. This is our collective interlude, our intermission, the day between Christmas and New Year's. But this brief interlude, our welcomed interval of rest and recovery, it will last only a moment because the story as always continues to go on and on and on. The stage manager has already called places for all of us in preparation for the next act. The curtain is drawn aside with a word from the director, action, and we are off and running as soon as uh, 12 o'clock comes past. (laughs) Now, lest we forget why we came today, let me remind you of where we are in the Christmas story, the narrative of Jesus and his birth, the storyteller's art and craft of how to express all that has happened with Jesus. Mary and Joseph found themselves in just such a moment, some 2,000 plus years ago, on the threshold of an interlude They were not likely convinced that all of life was good and all the days to come would be better. In fact, they were probably tempted to go back to that old standby for real. We are stuck between a rock and a hard place. They had endured hardship after hardship in their lives, but then a miracle shattered through the realities of everything that they knew to be true. And like a well-written novella, The future seems bright, but yet there are ominous clouds forming on the horizon. Given all that had come to pass, we know the story so well, those birth narratives we celebrate so beautifully on Christmas Eve. Scripture tells us that Mary treasured all that they experienced, pondering everything that had happened in her heart. Act 1 of our story gives us a glimpse. Luke chapter 2 tells it best. We often read it in church on Christmas Eve. Caesar Augustus issues a decree. A census would be taken in the entire Roman world. Joseph and Mary would travel across the wilderness in her ninth month of pregnancy. He would walk the rocky path, and she would ride on the back of a donkey. Now, Scripture doesn't actually say literally, that she rode on a donkey, but the legend, the folklore that goes around the birth narrative uh, holds true if we consider that they were clearly poor people. We know that based on their offerings that they brought to the temple later 
when they brought their child for circumcision. Only wealthy people rode horses or used chariots or carts. Regular working people only had access to donkeys or a donkey. Perhaps if we use our imagination, perhaps it was the donkey that gave them the right to enter the stable behind the inn in the first place. And that's the beauty of spoken legends surrounding the facts of his birth. We can imagine these things. We know the story so well. The baby was born there in a manger and the shepherds came to attend and they made their way to the stable and there they found the glory of God in the heavens wrapped in swaddling cloths and this would be a sign from God. Matthew picks up the story with where we were a moment ago. Joseph and Mary were making their long journey to Bethlehem for the census. Bethlehem. Or, or more accurately, Beit Lachem. Beit Lachem. A beautiful interlude for a moment. As an aside, the words that we see in the scriptures have such profound meaning. If you're aware of the meaning of each of the words or the traditional names of people and places, the scriptures can come to life in beautiful ways that give you instant contextual cues and offer a depth of story that is unimaginable. The Bible is truly a literary treasure, a masterpiece of narratives and poetry and history that come to life with a few simple explanations. It's a storyteller's masterpiece for all the generations. Even here, Bethlehem is one such name that gives us a clue about what God is doing in the story of Christ's birth. In, in Hebrew, the name Bethlehem is really the conjunction of two distinct words, Beit and Lachem. Beit meaning city or house, Lachem meaning bread. Jesus is literally born in Beit Lachem. And it implies so much about his destiny. As you recall, Jesus later identifies himself as the bread of life. In John chapter 6, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. The one who identifies himself as the bread of life is literally born in a place that is called the house of bread or the city of bread. He's born to a virgin in the city of bread so that he might be the bread of life to the world and that whoever comes to him will never be hungry again. It's one example of the beauty, uh, the consistency, the continuity of the story that we find in the original languages from Hebrew to Greek to Aramaic. I digress. Let's go back to the story. Joseph and Mary, they're there in the city of Bethlehem and they find themselves on the outside of the inn. We know the story so well. They're looking in. They're looking to find a place to stay, and they're rejected because of the crush of the world that has come upon this tiny hamlet, and they find only a place available in the corner of the stable where they will rest for the evening. If you allow the story to fill itself out, the contractions of childbirth are drawing closer and closer together that evening, and an angel appears to the shepherds tending their flocks in the nearby fields, and it says the words that we know so well, do not be afraid, I bring you good news, that great joy that will cause a great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. In that moment, in that brief interlude, Joseph and Mary breathe a sigh of relief. Their baby has come into the world healthy and well, strong and full of life. But they were the only witnesses, save for the animals sheltered in the stable for the night. If we add our imagination to the story, perhaps a midwife or others to assist, the scriptures do not really say. Only legend fills in the details. We're told the shepherds were drawn near by the voice of God and and they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. And, and that's when, after they departed, that's when uh, Mary treasured up all of those things in her heart. 
And we know that the story advances quickly, and sometime later, we're not sure if it was immediately or perhaps even two years later, but sometime later, the Christmas story says the Magi appear from the east, and they came asking, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? A very simple question offered to King Herod. But their inquiries brought an ominous turn, a plot twist that stands as a warning to the trouble ahead. Herod wanted to know where to find the child. He claimed to want to worship the one who had come, but we would soon discover that he had a sinister intent. The wise men from the east brought gold, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and they also brought that thinly veiled threat from King Herod, the maniacal king, innocently offered at first, but soon revealed as a not-so-idle threat of death and destruction. Cue the ominous music again. End of Act One, our interlude. And we pause for a moment to catch our breath. There's an inkling of a threat from a king, we know, but this peaceful interlude, this intermission in the development of the storyline, the play before us, the moment of literary silence allows us a few fleeting seconds to soak in all that had happened just like Mary, and we can ponder them in our hearts, and we can say, Selah. All too quickly, Acts chapter 2, Act number 2 begins and from his innocent beginnings, we know that Jesus would be a thorn in the flesh, an active threat to all of the authorities, both in Rome, in the empire, and within the Jewish sect into which he was born. We know from Scripture that Herod's wrath would be unleashed upon the city of Bethlehem once he realized he had been outwitted by those magi. And Matthew writes this, Herod was furious and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. It was Joseph who was warned by an angel of the Lord in a dream to escape to Egypt to avoid the wrath of Herod. And when he did this, he immediately took the child and his mother away from the threat against their lives. As we read earlier, Matthew writes, so he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt where they stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. It was Joseph who said, we must go now. Mary had treasured all those things in her heart, and they were, she was pondering them over and over. And then the ultimate disappointment came in a moment that can be overlooked. It was a simple interlude in the development of the story from a big picture perspective, a not so subtle interlude in the story of redemption, the redemption of all humanity, introduced by divine intervention. Joseph said, We must go. Now, it was out of frustration with the disobedience of the Magi and, and out of a rage of jealousy for his throne, the maniacal Herod orders the death of every boy in the region under the years of two years of age. Indeed, it was the fulfillment of prophecy, prophecy that goes all the way back to the time when Israel was forced into exile by the Assyrians or maybe later by the Babylonians in 586 when the temple was destroyed. And these words were spoken then, and the, the master storyteller in Matthew brings them forward through the generations and applies them to Jesus. And this issue with Herod says a voice is heard in Ramah, Weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. It's a reference to the tragedy of the exiles. And here, a reference to the tragedy of what King Herod has decreed. A sweet moment of a newborn child and 
The days of tender nurture between mother and child would be shattered by the execution of infants from within the city and the surrounding region. It was a historical event that came to be known as the massacre of the innocents in the church. Historians debate the actual uh, factual details of the event. Some would say it's legend, folklore. Others would hold that it is a more traditional historical event. But the more interesting point for me is how this part of the story draws us back into the Old Testament again. It's a, a reflection of the story of Moses, this the Savior that's come and now in jeopardy. Moses is mentioned in Exodus chapter 1 and 2, the birth of Moses. And at the very end of the first chapter of Exodus, we find another plot twist, another interlude, the, the writer of Exodus. And now Matthew is drawing this forward into what we uh, read as the story of Christ. says this, when Pharaoh gave, Pharaoh gave uh, his order to all the people, every Hebrew boy that is born you must throw into the Nile, but every, let every girl live. You remember that story. We remember how an infant boy was born into the tribe of Levi, and he was set adrift in a basket in the Nile with the hopes that he might be saved. And he was discovered by the Pharaoh's daughter floating in the Nile. And she asked one of the Hebrew women to nursemaid the baby. And by chance, the woman selected was the baby's actual birth mother. <laughs> Coincidence. The baby, as you recall, was named Moses. And indeed, he would become the deliverer of all Israel. It's no coincidence in the way that the writer of Matthew, Matthew interweaves these ancient stories into the birth narrative of Jesus. He's telling us that Jesus is a type of Moses cast into the future. Just as Moses was the one who saved all of Israel, so too would Jesus be the one to save the entire world. Back to the story. Imagine the agony of the people. Uh, likely every family in Bethlehem would be touched in a way that would tear their heart asunder. Imagine those families with the baby boy who was the firstborn. Imagine if that baby boy was your lastborn, your baby. The hopes and dreams of those children and families would be crushed at the point of a Roman spear. In an instant, Mary and Joseph knew they were between a rock and a hard place, and their options were bad and getting worse. And they were stuck between the infinitely divine beauty of his birth and now this ominous threat of the unknown, even the threat of death at the hands of the Roman authorities. So they fled for their lives, for the life of their firstborn child. They fled to Egypt to protect their son, but little did they know they were saving the life of the one who would ultimately save all of humanity, you and me. You may have felt like they were between a rock and a hard place for sure. But from our perspective, they were between the promises of God as fulfilled in baby Jesus and the hope of the world yet to be revealed. It's all about perspective, right? We have this unique privilege of seeing the story as it unfolds as the reader from beginning to end, and we can interject ourselves into the story at our leisure whenever we would like. There is no crisis for us. But Mary and Joseph could only sense the real threat against the life of their son. And in that moment, they knew they were between a rock and a hard place. The story progresses all too quickly. In four short verses, Herod eventually dies, and the angel appears once again to Joseph, telling him to return to the land of Israel. He says, in Matthew, having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. There's a name that we know. And he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So it was fulfilled that was said through the prophets that he would be called a Nazarene. All these names and words and places have historical significance. Again, looking at the bigger picture, we recall that Moses had to flee for his life later in life, only to return when those who sought his death were themselves dead. Another literary coincidence. 
The Christmas story ends with Jesus as a child living in Nazareth. Indeed, he was the fulfillment of prophecy after prophecy, and his ministry had yet to begin. Another interlude there in Nazareth, allowing us to catch our breath. The story of the birth of Jesus and his early ministry, his early life, is a beautiful story, but it's only the beginning. Stay tuned, as Paul Harvey would say, and now for the rest of the story. Here at church, we will stay tuned to that story, and for us, more is yet to come. With every curtain call, with every act performed, with every actor, good or bad, with every interlude, with every intermission, with every pause and reflection, the story of Jesus reflects the depths of God's love for humanity, for you and for me, and God's desire to save the world. Joseph and Mary found themselves between that rock and a hard place, but yet God was still faithful. And God turned what the world and Herod in particular meant for evil into what God would use for good. Now, if we're honest, life can make us feel that very same way, like we're caught between a rock and a hard place. Before we know it, we look for our grounding, our spiritual mourning, and our anchor in the storm, and God can prove himself faithful again and again, each and every time, given enough time. Perhaps we're here, gathered on Sunday between Christmas and New Year's, and God wants to give us a bigger picture. There's always a plot twist in our lives, just as we see in the scriptures. There will always be the threat of evil. As one of our pastors, Mark Sorensen, mentioned recently in a study on Herod, he said, we will always have our own version of King Herod lurking around the corner or more likely deep within. We will always need to overcome. God may have us running for the hills to save our very lives, but God will always provide a way for us to return. And God's plan will not be thwarted even if we are forced to travel through our own personal Egypt. God will get us to the place where we need to be. God is always faithful. And on this Sunday morning, we can ask ourselves that very simple question, so what now? (laughs) I want you to know the final chapter of your faith journey has yet to be written. And quite simply, we use his story as our guide and we look forward to see what God is going to do in the coming year. And we offer a simple blessing. May God be with you. May God be with you. Selah. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all of God's people say, Amen. Amen.